to really look at the issue of education. And for me, I want to reflect on what's happened before, listening to those who, would, who have made it through different interventions and initiatives and actions by different people. And I really want to look at the issue of us looking and reflecting on the gap when it comes to girls' education in Africa, or education in Africa in particular. And I want to look at the gender gap. And I've really titled it Mind the Gender Gap, primarily because I'm interested in girls who've been left behind. I can imagine that none of those girls that have been left behind can ever be kind the Einsteins that we've been, we've been looking for or we'd want to look for from Africa because they've been left behind from education through different experiences and different actions, not by the girls themselves, but by society, by their families and by the communities in particular. And I have been so concerned about the issue of girls and gender and discrimination and rights and stereotypes and things that really put girls away from education. And I think it's important for us to reflect on those who have been left behind or those who continue being left behind or those who would never be part of that ladder of education. I know that in the last, um, I wouldn't say beginning of the, uh, of the millennium, the, the international development um, put together the Millennium Development Goals. And I'm sure most of you know about the Millennium Development Goals. And the whole focus on Millennium Development Goals on poverty and education and maternal health and the child health and HIV and AIDS and gender equality. But when they looked at the targets for education, the targets was primarily on primary schools. And I know that if the education ends in primary schools, we won't get the scientists we want. We won't get the doctors we want in Africa. We won't get the innovators to actually make a difference. And I think for me, it's important to look at targets beyond primary education. And even when we look at primary education, a lot of the issues are around primary school enrollment. And I want to look at what are the issues that actually focus or affect retention in schools. And that's the issue that I really want to look at. We've been talking about bring back the girls. And for me, this issue of bring back the girls is really, really hit me in a sense that I just realized that the 270 girls who were forcibly taken away from school at the time that they were doing their exams really made the whole world stand up. We had Michelle Obama, a lot of fantastic people standing up, some marching, protesting, that bring back the girls home. But I want to really look about bring back the girls to school. This is because this is not the first time that girls have dropped out of school or have been taken away from homes. The reality is that for a lot of girls, they're taken away from school by the families themselves. Why? Because of societal stereotypes and cultural uh, uh, determinants and cultural expectations of women and girls. And for a lot of girls, particularly girls in rural areas, what we find is, why are you going to school? You're only going to end up in somebody's kitchen. And if you're going to end up in somebody's kitchen, there is no point in going to school. We better just train you on domestics around how to fetch water, how to cook, how to grind, how to do the basics that will make you a good wife. 
You're not going to be a scientist. You're not going to do all that technology things for you to be a wife. So the gender stereotypes around what we expect of girls really means that we don't have a lot of a lot of vision or passion for these girls to do anything other than to not to go to school. And so for me, there are millions of girls who are out of school. There are millions of girls who never have the chance to go to school. I had some discussions recently with my project partners when I went to Tanzania and we were talking about girls not in school. And what I realized that for a lot of professional women in Africa, for them to actually operate effic effic efficiently, they actually need to have maid servant. And those maid servants never go to school. Most of them are, are brought from the rural areas to come and stay with their uncles and aunties. They are told that Come and stay with your auntie in the city. She'll take you to school. Most of those girls never go to school. And I, I had these discussions because there was a newspaper article in Tanzania. And it talked about this girl who had been brought from a rural area to come and stay with her, her auntie to be taken to school. And she was so brutalized that she finally ended up in hospital. And when her mother came and she spoke to the girl, she said, I never knew. Because these girls are hidden in rooms. Nobody knows what happens to them. We never talk about these girls. We need to bring them back to school. We definitely need to bring them back to school. We are wasting a whole future of girls in Africa. And you go to so many cities you find domestic servants who are brutalized, who are just brought up to look after our children so that our children can go to school, so that our children can have the best of education, but they never have it. We do need to look at this. We need to bring back the girls to school. So whilst we are reflecting on these girls that have been taken away from Chibok, let's really reflect on all the other girls that have been left behind. And I think for me, this is a real reality for us. I love this poster. I saw it in Tanzania. And it's about another main reason why girls are not in school. Because they are made to get married. They are forced to get married. Forward did some very interesting research recently in Tanzania, and it was about women affected by obstetric fistula, which is also another disability that women have when they marry too early, when they have babies too early, and when they have no access to emergency obstetric care, and they tend to have birth complications, and they leak, and they smell, and they are they are rejected, they are stigmatized, they are thrown away. We did some research with them, and this is very innovative research, which we call PEER. And we worked with the girls and the women who've been affected to go and collect data about social life in their community. And some of the very interesting information that came out was the issue of child marriage. The women said, for a lot of the girls, they are forced into marriage. The parents want them to go into marriage. Why? Because of the bride price. Because of poverty. Now, for a lot of girls, you can get married for maybe five cows, 10 cows, 20 cows, depending on what the family wants and what the suitor is prepared to give. And ultimately, most of those suitors are older men, much, much older than these girls, more experienced. And these girls come into the homes almost always as maybe second or third wives. These girls will often not go to school. And the quote from one of this peer study was a girl who was 13, and she said she was still in primary school. And her father told her, I've had so many of these stories. A 13-year-old girl said she got 
uh, at the time we met her, she was 17. She also said she was married when she was 11 because her father died. And her uncle said, there is no way that you can continue in school. We have to marry you off. And this girl was married to a man who was 20 years older than her. And she was brought away all the way from northern Tanzania to Dar es Salaam. This girl didn't know anybody. She was locked up. <clears throat> Most of the time when the man was out, when she was in labor, there was nobody to hear her. She had to cry and her neighbors had to knock down the door to take her to hospital. When we met the girl, she's called Margaret. She was 17. She said, I still want to go back to school. And I will go back to school. So when we look at the issue of child marriage, data that we have shows that 44% of girls in Africa are married before they're 18 years. What does that mean? In some places like Niger, it's about 70%. Some of the girls can be as young as seven years. Why should we do this to our girls? We're talking about bringing back our girls, bringing them back home. What are they gonna get home? What kind of environment do we have for them at home? How can these girls continue to have a future if we don't give them the right environment? The other issue that almost always comes together with child marriage is the issue of female genital mutilation. And I always see it all the time. And for a lot of these girls, once you go through female genital mutilation, it's time to get married. We know that in Africa alone, about three million girls go through female genital mutilation every year. The data from UNICEF shows that about 135 million people have been through female genital mutilation. And for a lot of us, we keep silent about these things because it's right. It's the norm, you know, because somebody wants you to be that way. Why are we not talking? Why are we silent? This was a study I found and I was really amazed. Girls are forced out of school. They're forced out of school because they are pregnant. In a lot of schools in Africa, I found it in Tanzania, it's in Uganda and it's in Kenya. I haven't done much studies in other countries. But girls are forcibly made to go through pregnancy tests. And if you're pregnant, you're kicked out of school. You don't have the chance to go back to school for a lot of these girls. And if you're pregnant and you don't have anywhere to go, what's the future for you? It's really, really worrying. Data from Tanzania show that about 50,000 girls have been kicked out of school in the last 10 years. And I'm sure that's an underestimation. We also know that a lot of the girls who don't go to school or were expelled from school, 5% of those were due to teenage pregnancy. Why are we doing this to our girls? I was very amazed when I did some the peer, and I love doing this peer because you really see a lot of people's <coughs> views. And we asked somebody, why are these girls not in school? And why are teenage girls who are pregnant not allowed to go to school? This is somebody who worked in a family planning institution. He told me that it's not allowed because the girls will contaminate the others. I didn't know girls made themselves pregnant of pregnancy was a fashion, and you saw somebody and you readily go and get pregnant because somebody else is pregnant. Who is making these girls pregnant? Some of them are teachers. Some of them are uncles. Some of them are fathers. Some of them are boyfriends. Because for most of these girls, even access to sexual and reproductive health information in schools is a challenge. We had a girl who said when they started teaching them about HIV and they were giggling, the teacher said, well, then I'm not teaching you anymore. And she left the class. That was the end of their sex education. Another concern for me is child mothers. When these girls get pregnant, 
This lady is a young Ethiopian lady I met in Gonda, somewhere in northern Ethiopia. She told me she was one of the best students. They used to take her from her school to other schools to do competitions, to really show others how to do the things that other students couldn't do. She was a bright student. But at a point, she was asked to get married because her father, again, had died. And when I met her, she had a baby. She helped to do this peer we did among uh, child brides in Ethiopia. And one of the things that really struck me about her was she had resigned herself to her fate. She said, I, I, I can't do anything else. And I asked her, so what are you doing now? She said she breaks stones on the side of the road. That's the work she's been doing. And I said, can't you go back to school? She said, no, I can't. How can I? How many of these girls do we find in so many parts of the world? How can they go back to school? Because nobody is listening to them. Nobody is helping them. Nobody is supporting them. And we did a very interesting thing as part of the research. We did a stakeholder consultation where these girls had the opportunity to speak to the district officials at the local authority level. And a lot of them were saying, but you know, the policy is that these girls should go back to school. They can't be allowed back to school. And one girl said, no, that's not my experience. I wanted to go back to school, but I was, I was turned away from school. A lot of these girls still have a passion to want to go to school. Why are we not bringing them back to school? I had a chance in UK to work with a young girl from the Gambia who'd had a baby when she was 15. She had a chance to go back to school. She had a chance to do everything. She, to, go, to get back her vision, to get back her, 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 her main drive. But how many of these girls in Africa have that chance? Very few of them. And I think we need to reflect. And for me, the way forward, I really think we need to transform all these social norms that really bring girls down, that really makes us feel that a girl is no, is nothing. You know, we, we, we say such flippant things about girls. She's only a girl, you know. And, and sometimes even in the home, I mean, these girls are not allowed to speak. Like Pressure said, the girls were told to bring mops to come and clean. But that's the future of a girl. She needs to start early. She needs to do that all the time. What are we doing about transforming these norms? And some of these norms are actually upheld by religious leaders and traditional authorities. So we need to engage different players without engaging them in raising awareness that these girls also can be doctors. These girls also can be scientists. These girls can be everything other than just girls. How do we do it? What do we need to do? We need to really look at investing in critical people. But for us, it's very important that we invest in the girls as well. Not just investing in girls that, you know, um, they're going to school, because we do know that even school itself has so many barriers. And I haven't even talked about the barriers in school. I'm just talking about the barriers outside school. And I think by addressing some of these barriers, both in school and out of school, we can enable girls to make a difference. We can enable girls to go back to school and we can bring back those girls that have been left behind. How do we invest in practical needs of these girls, but also invest in their strategic needs? Girls coming together, girls bonding with other girls, girls seeing that they can have a friendship, they can have an environment, a space where they can really grow. They can learn to talk about things. It's really sad when you see a girl telling you that because she doesn't have pad, so she can't go to school during her menses. Why do we do that to our girls? We don't tell them what they need to know. These are practical things that we need to equip girls in order for them to go to school. For a lot of girls who go through female genital mutilation, you're no longer fit to go to school, particularly in rural areas. It's time to get married. 
Why do we allow girls who've had babies not to go to school? We need to invest in, in processes, in systems that will enable these girls to go back to school. I haven't seen any crash in any rural areas or any crash attached to any schools for these girls to go back to school. Because nobody, nobody is interested in these girls. And why are we not interested in them? Because we don't see them as the future of Africa. Why do we do that? Because our policymakers really don't think about rural areas, don't think about girls in slum areas. They are not the same because their children can be shipped to Europe anywhere else for school. These rural girls, well, they are just rural people. How do we improve the policy environment? We need to really invest in that. And without that, we cannot make a difference to these girls. But I think, for me, the most important thing is investing in evidence, doing research, gathering the information, and helping us to make a difference and to make decisions about girls in Africa. And I hope that I have managed to really share some of these issues around girls left behind and for us to reflect on the need to bring these girls back to school. Thank you very much. Thank you.